Um, in our last voice thread, the question that I kind of left you guys with was this sense of, okay, well, supposing that we hadn't had the press, like the technologies of the press, what would you think would be different? Um, and part of what I wanted to kind of like gesture toward with that question is that I think one of, so like one of the charges, and I'm not sure that it's fair, but I think it's a good way of kind of getting a grip at the differences between Adrian Johns and Eisenstein. So one of the critiques that has been leveled against her is that she falls prey to what's known as technological determinism. And I think many of you have probably heard of this in other classes that you've taken. But the idea of technological determinism is really like it's a theory about how technology affects society. And that's really like a very like good way to describe it because in some sense, it's like we sort of divorce technology and society and like technology acts as this like force on society and then like creates changes. And you know, if you're, you know, like in, in some sense, like that can be kind of intuitive if we think about, you know, like like the effects of certain kinds of technologies, um, you know, we might want to say like, well, yeah, it seems like there are effects of technologies. But one of the things that can be difficult is if we talk about it and we use that language, if we say the press caused X, um, what Johns would want to say is that, what are you talking about the press? You know, like the press is a tool, it is technology, it's used by people. And by the way, there were none of these norms that we have today at the time that the press was invented. So when we first introduced Adrian Johns, right, we had that quote about being able to like pick up a book and being able to sort of like just know that like, yes, this is a book by Elizabeth Eisenstein and it is what it reports to be. And if I have another copy of the book, all of the pages are the same. And he wants to say, well, yes, today in 2000 and whatever, that's true. You can pick up a book and you can know those things about it. But when the press was very young, that was not in place. So really, I think where we see um, the split between Eisenstein and Johns is about not this sort of like, I mean, they both really agree that like, yes, at some point we came to this thing that was called print culture. But when Eisenstein wants to make these claims about the development of science, which was happening in a very particular time period and wants to say that the press was very influential there, John's kinds of wants to say that your argument is relying over much on a lot of the features of print culture that are happening here that weren't there back then. There just had not been enough time passing and people hadn't had a chance to work that out. And that was how those things happened. It was about people, not technology. So he thinks that she's kind of mushing things together in ways that are not quite right. And in order to sort of establish that argument, one of the things he points to is sort of thinking about Tycho Bray and Galileo and pointing to the ways in which there was a lot of messiness in that period. So for Eisenstein, one of the things about Galileo's trial is she kind of wants to say, well, the reason that Galileo got into so much trouble was simply because it was really impossible for the church to effectively suppress his works. So, I mean, you know, they were censored, but that just made them more popular. That wouldn't have been a problem in a culture that was driven by manuscripts because there simply weren't enough of them and it took so long to copy things that it was really easy just to kind of censor stuff and shut them down. But once you had print and you had multiple printing shops, right, like you have this exponential growth where things like there are little points that have a copy and then those grow and then those grow and then those grow, right? So you can't censor it. And so the ideas are spreading and the content is spreading. And I say the content loosely and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Galileo can't do anything about it. The church can't do anything about it. This is just going. 
What Eisenstein wants to point to is this proliferation and like the sort of like literally you can imagine it like fireworks kind of popping up, right? And there's, you know, except that they don't they don't just like fall away and like go down to the ground. Like like they pop up and they stay and they're there. And this is a problem. You know, like 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 the church sort of wants to kind of control this. They can't. And so they clamp down on him. So for Eisenstein, this is really a demonstration of the power of the press itself, that it sort of illustrates this way in which things have kind of gotten, they're disruptive. They've, they've gotten out of hand. What Johns wants to point to is that it's true. It might be disruptive. There are a lot of different copies but there is nothing of the standardization. There's nothing of the fixity. This is sort of piratical, like it's piracy. And many of those copies are actually not right. So they don't actually accurately reflect, um, like they don't actually accurately reflect what was going on in Galileo's original treaties. So the sense in which you could say this demonstrates the power of the press, well, it demonstrates this sort of power, like, you know, something spreading, but it doesn't demonstrate any of the features of print culture that um, Eisenstein links to the growth of science, where it's like building networks and providing reliable, accurate copies. So he wants to say, if you think that the what, ha like what, um, what the press contributed to science was this ability to grow networks of communication. That is maybe certainly true, perhaps if people are talking to each other, but this idea that it increases access to reliable um, documents, that is not something that is present in the case of Galileo, and yet Eisenstein seems to make a lot of this power of dissemination when she's talking about the particular, like the particular like details of the trial. So in some sense, that I think is a really important way of characterizing the nature of the debate between them, at least as it pertains to Galileo's trial.